Hi everyone and welcome back or welcome to the psychology of success. I'm Paul McVeigh and as an elite athlete I truly believe that my 20 year playing career was as a result of my mindset and attitude and the ability to empower yourself through your thinking was transformative for me and the reason why I do what I do now is 100% down to my mentality which is the perfect segue into my next guest because if you're going to be the best in the world in your profession then the six inches between your ears must play a pivotal role. So let's welcome world snooker champion, Ken Doherty. Ken, how are you doing? I'm very well, Paul. Very, very well. Thank you. Good man. Good, good to have you on, on the psychology of success. And, and it's great to, great to see you have another fellow Irish man on, on the show as well. And I'm going to kick off the way we do with, with everyone who's been on the show so far and ask you yeah. the first question, which is, what is the definition of success? Oh, uh, well, it can be measured in lots of ways, I suppose. It's, it's very hard to put it into just one simple sentence, but uh, it depends on your outlook, I suppose. You know, when people say, oh, well, you know, winning the world championship, that you'll always be remembered for that. But there was lots of, uh, there was lots of sort of pathways to, to reaching the pinnacle. Uh, which was, of course, winning the World Championship. But there was lots of great successes. I mean, you know, you could look at sort of Jimmy White. He's never won the World Championship, but he still had a very, very successful career and a lots of successes. Um, but for me, I suppose I'll always be remembered for, for winning the World Championship and, uh, you know, lifting it up and putting my name on the cup along with the great, you know, fellow Irishman, Alex Higgins, who won it, uh, you know, in 72 and 82. And, of course, Dennis Taylor, We'll never forget that Black Paul final in 1985. Uh, they were sort of big inspirations for me. So to go alongside them on the cup uh, was absolutely fantastic. You know? So I think it's it's interesting because we're probably going to go straight into the the work side of life and the and the career and that's what you know potentially what the definition you're talking about there. So I'd just really be interested in Ken in, in understanding how that happens. You know because you don't wake up suddenly as a world snooker champion. And, you know, the old phrase of, you know, it takes a lifetime of achievement to become an overnight success. So where did it really start for you? Because I'm guessing you must have been seeing this on TV and potentially being inspired by what you saw. Absolutely. I saw, I don't remember, uh, when you remember Pop Black all those years ago when it came on TV. Yeah. Uh, like when I saw Pop Black first, I think it was only about eight years of age. Uh, I used to, my father used to put it on on a Thursday night. It'd come on for about a half an hour. They play two single frames, uh, so they'd have like a couple of matches, uh, and that was the first time I saw Alex Egan. It's the first time I saw a snooker on TV, and I was absolutely fascinated by it. Uh, I asked Santa for a small little snooker table, which was at the end of my bunk bed. It was only about this size uh, that Christmas, and that one would have been around nineteen seventy-seven. And from then, I was I was absolutely uh, hooked and mesmerized. I wanted to. You know, the, the table would come out, we'd put it on the kitchen table or we put it on the floor and we'd play away with my brothers and my father. And uh, we had a, we was lucky because we had a couple of snooker clubs in the little village that I lived in, Renla. And uh, I used to be able to go in there maybe on a Sunday afternoon. That was because I was so young. But as, as I sort of got a little bit older, uh, it was sort of every day straight after school, school bag under the snooker table. Uh, I used to like sweep the floors, empty the ashtrays, do a little bit of hoover and get a free game on the Space Invaders, on the pool and, and even on the snooker table. I mean, when I started playing on the big tables around the Jasons and Renla back in those, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, I, I used to stand, I used to have those old Jacob's biscuit tins, I used to have to stand up and, and play uh, and kick, the, and kick the, the biscuits in around the table. But I was still funny enough beating my brother and beating his friends and a lot of kids older than me. So I was getting great kudos and I was getting great excitement out of it. So do you, do you think that's what it is? Because it, it, almost when you talked about that small snicker table you had as a, as a kid, I just saw your face lighting up, almost like it's you know brought you all the way back as waking up on Christmas morning. Was, was it just simply the joy of playing snooker or as you mentioned more at the end of that answer, how you started to become good at it and then that's a little bit of more significance for you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, uh, that, that day, the, the Christmas morning is, is as clear as it is now, you know, all, all these years later. Uh, and it was in, it, like, back then, like, I don't know what it was like for you, but 
the, the, the Christmas presents were never sort of wrapped up. They were just put in a box and they were at the end of the bunk bed. And I was so excited just picking up the, the snooker table. It was just, uh, yeah, I, I, and I can, it does. It sort of brings a little tear to my eye because it, it, they're sort of images that you never forget. And they were, that, that was like an inspiration, you know, and the, the fact that I got so much pleasure out playing, uh, it was the excitement of competition, of taking other guys on, of beating them, the exhilaration, uh, the adrenaline sort of fueled games that I used to, to have. And that, you know, football used to give it to me a little bit, but not the same as it used to uh, playing snooker. You know, I used to play football for the local football team. I was captain of the local football team. But uh, I sort of gave it up when I was about 15 uh, to concentrate on playing snooker. But, uh, yeah, I think it was just the excitement, uh, the competition, trying to get better, the excitement of getting better, beating other guys, and the exhilaration of, of, of winning matches. It was fantastic. And, and how much of this was driven by you and how much was this being supported by your family? Uh, oh, it was just purely me. I mean, <laughs> my mother, uh, my father, unfortunately, my father died when I was only 13, you know. he um, So he never really got to see me play. He saw me play at home on the little table. And when I got to about 12, I got a, like a six by three table that we used to put out in the garden or out in the garden shed. Uh, but he died when I was only 13, and my first competition was uh, only a, f a few months later, uh, in August. He died in June 1983, and uh, quite suddenly. And, and um, my first competition was a couple of months after that, that I, I actually won. So I was only 13, it was an under-16 sort of 16 event. And uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was the unfortunate thing. It, it, my mother didn't want me to play snooker at all, as much as she bought a snooker table for me. Uh, she didn't want me to play at all because she used to chase me out of the snooker club around the corner from the house with the wooden spoon to get back and do my homework, you know, because I, as I said, I'd get off the bus and run straight into the snooker club, pass by the house, uh, skill bag under the table, and I'd stay there until around six o'clock in the evening until it was time for dinner. So my mother was always very insistent on education first. And that was something that I would tell my own child as well. And she was dead right, you know, as long as I did my homework and got some good grades in school, uh, I never missed from school. I never sort of played trill for fear of my mother and the wooden spoon for sure. And uh, she always insisted, get a good education, do your homework, get your grades, and then you can play as much snooker as you like, give it a go if you want. But yeah, she was quite, in, uh, quite sort of insistent on that. And it always sort of stood with me. So that, that's interesting because that is identical to what happened to me growing up where my mom actually put me into a school it was a christian brother school where we didn't even play football and, and you know i was going over to tottenham hotspur at the time and i wasn't able to play football at school so interesting your mom is saying the same how you know education's the most important thing when actually yes. snooker has given you a career and an incredible life that did yeah yeah absolutely yeah but i think she was you know i could understand what way she was thinking, you know, because my own son, who plays tennis now, but I always say to him, and, and he wants to like pursue it as much as he can. Uh, he's gone actually to a tennis skill now, but I always even say to him now, uh, to say that, you know, make sure your homework and your grades, you, you keep studying, you keep, because, you know, your education as you go through life, and it doesn't matter what you achieve in sport or, or whatever, your education will always stand to you. And uh, I think that was very, very important. And yes, you get a great education in life through sport as well. And you can learn different things as you go on. But I think to start you off, to get you in that right frame of mind, I think the education part is, is very, very important. And uh, yeah, so I, I was always very conscious of that. She was, quite, she, was a, she was quite a fair woman, but she was tough, you know, when she had to be. Uh, but I think uh, I appreciate that more as I get older, as I get older, and I, I, I've sort of become a parent myself. Yeah, and it sounds almost the exact same as my mum. I don't, don't know whether we actually are brothers and we had the same mum or not, but that, that is the same story that we got growing up. But, but <laughs> interestingly, Ken, and again, uh, apologies, I didn't realise that about your father passing away whenever you were only 13. I wasn't aware of that until you've just, you just shared that with me and, and everyone listening. But... Can I ask how much of that you know, really tragic event at a, at a really you know 
young age in life, how much do you think that either impacted or influenced your snooker? I think it did a lot, you know, subconsciously it did a lot. It sort of gave me a, a, a great drive. Um, it sort of, you know, I, I sort of, I, I, lots of those images of sitting with my dad watching the World Championship, watching Higgins win it in 82, and he was always a Ray Reardon fan. And I and I was always, of course, up for Alex Higgins. So, we, we, you know, we shared some some great times in that respect, like watching watching the snooker matches, watching Pop Black. He, he was sort of introduced me to snooker first of all uh so yeah i mean it, it's sort of a it, it's a feeling that sort of i i have a regret of that you never actually got to see me play you know even in any competition or or win anything you know of all those years but certainly i always felt that he was always there on my shoulder always in the back of my mind i was always driving me forward uh trying to trying to be the best i could trying to you know just trying to always sort of dig in never give up always have that sort of no matter how far you were behind you'd always sort of keep trying keep playing as, as well as you could and, and never give in and uh, yeah he I, I always felt even when i won the world championship i said to myself like and when i came off the table i said this is this was for my father and of course you know for all the rest of my family who were back in dublin but particularly he was in my mind the forefront of my mind when i was lifting up the trophy yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really, really powerful, and, and and I think that that is an amazing and hopefully inspirational story to the people listening of of just what you can do when you have that kind of feeling of belief of wanting to do it, not just for yourself but for your family and everyone else. And 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 interesting again, I just want to go back on something else you said there, Ken, because you talked about how you know you were a decent footballer, you, you enjoyed the football captain and the team, and yet you left that team environment. To go and be you know an individual athlete an individual player was that uh, a difficult transition or was it more naturally suited to you uh no it was it was difficult enough because i was as i said i was captain of the team uh, and and the football i absolutely love i still love it today i go back and play with my friends on a wednesday now we have like an eight nine aside on the astro and, and i absolutely love it uh but no it was a conscious decision because like on Saturday mornings, we were playing uh, matches, you know, all over Dublin, whatever, in the leagues and stuff like that. Um, and But on Saturday morning in the local snooker club in Jason's, where I played, uh, we used to have a Saturday morning handicap uh, tournament, snooker tournament. And more often than not, I used to win that tournament, whether I'd be given, you know, 50 starts, 60 starts, 70 starts. It was only like five pounds in, and the winner would get like maybe 30 or 40 pounds. But... I wanted to be in there playing, you know, snooker in that tournament every Saturday, as opposed to going out on a bus and, and going and playing football uh, with the lads. I, I always, even though I loved the team environment, uh, I was more of an individual, you know, and snooker sort of suited me more. I was getting more fun out of it. I was getting a, a greater rush out of it. Uh, and of course the onus was all on me as opposed to, you know, worrying about your teammates trying to help out or pulling their weight or stuff like that. I knew that if I pulled my weight on the snooker table, more often than not, I was going to, I was going to win this competition every Saturday. And of course I was getting a few bob as well. I was getting like 30, 40, 50 pounds, you know, which uh, at a 13 or 14, 15, no, sorry, 15 I was then, 14, 15. Uh, it was, it was always nice going to school on the Monday morning, you know, with a pocket full of change and you'd be buying sweets and stuff like that. So, uh, but also, what it was doing it was it was a great sort of grounding sort of uh, for me and learning experience about playing under pressure giving starts you know having to give 70 or 80 or sometimes even 100 starts to some of the other uh, members uh, but trying to win under that pressure and uh, so that was a great sort of breeding ground for me as i sort of progressed and, uh, as an amateur and became uh, you know up through the ranks even as an amateur in ireland and, and, th and that really is, is the complete opposite of, you know, jokingly about how we seem like to be identical growing up, but then that's the opposite of, of everything I've done of my life because I've always been in a team environment. I love being around people. I get so much energy from others. And yet mm. you're suddenly more drawn to that individual life and it's almost solitary because I'm guessing as you get later on and you start uh, practicing by yourself all the time. What are the what would you say was the kind of the pros and cons of suddenly going into that individual sport? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the pros, uh, obviously, is that, you know, the onus is on yourself to put in the work and, and try and develop your own skills and, and develop your sort of mental attitude and, and your sort of your, your, your will to win, uh, your psychology of the game. Um, the other, the, the sort of cons against it are, are sort of, I mean, I love, I love team sports. I love playing football. As I said, I still love playing now. And I love being around the mates and the banter and stuff like that. And I suppose going back to snooker, you're always on your own, you know, and that, they're, they're sort of the downsides, you know, that you travel on your own or you're being on your own most of the time. The guys that you would meet at snooker tournaments, they're all trying to buy up the same prize. So, so even though you get on well, you might have a little bit of banter. But at the end of the day, when you get on that snooker table, it's sort of... Uh, you know, every man for himself, basically, you know, and, and it doesn't matter who you are playing. I mean, if you're playing your brother, your, your sister, your mother on the snooker table, you still want to win. You know, you have to have that drive mentality uh, to try and win and and, and, uh, and be the best you can. Whereas, like, in football, sometimes, you know, you'd be relying on other guys playing well with you, you know, no matter how much you tried hard, if the other guys weren't pulling their weight, you know, you could still get beat, and that was the very frustrating thing about playing football. But that was the great thing that I loved about playing snooker. Well, if you're just joining us, we're here with Ken Doherty, world snooker champion, and we're going live across LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Now, Ken, you, you're talking about you know this sort of fledgling love of snooker and starting to do well, starting to earn a couple of pounds, you know, at the weekends in, in the local club. When did things really become serious for you? Or maybe when did you make the decision that this could be a potential career for you? Uh, well, I, I t uh, when I finished school, I finished my leaving uh, cert in uh, 1987. And then I went back to repeat in 1988 a couple of subjects that I thought I could have done better in. And in, in in those years that you could actually amalgamate the two uh, the two years of your best subject. So I did that. Um, I won the world. Uh, I won the Irish Amateur Championship in 1987, and then uh, so I was basically the top dog in Ireland as an amateur. Now, uh, as the senior amateur, it's not as, as obviously as junior. I was about uh, 17 at the time. Um, I lost in the very first round of the amateur championships in 1988 when I was trying to defend the title, and. I sort of, after that defeat, I thought, I, I can't stay in Ireland anymore. If I want to progress and try and be the best I can be, I can't stay in Ireland because in Ireland, there were only so, so many good players. I know that I knew that in England, there were so many more and it was pro-ams and I could sort of develop a lot better against better players. So I decided to make a, a conscious decision to just go to England and just try it out, you know, and I made that decision in 1988. Uh, I had 500 pounds that I'd saved up. Uh, I went across to England with a fellow from Cork called Anthony O'Connor. Uh, we were staying in digs in, in Chiswick in his uh, mother's cousin's place. We got free snooker, Eugene Hughes, who was our professional in Ilford Snooker Centre, which was on the east side of London, uh, got us some free snooker over there. So we'd have to travel from Chiswick all the way to uh, Ilford, which was 36 stops on the district line. It took us an hour and a half. Then we had to get two buses. So we'd go 36 stops every day over there, get off, get two buses to Ilford and then practice every day and then get back on the two buses, get back on the district line and, and another 36 stops all the way back to Chiswick. We did that for two weeks and uh, oh, it was like a nightmare. It was, took us two hours to get there and two hours back and then we had to play the snooker in between. And um, But luckily, Eugene Hughes um, said, why don't you try and get some digs over here? I'll put you up for a couple of weeks and try and get your own little place over here, a little apartment and stuff like that. So that's what we did. So we, we ended up staying with him for about six weeks until we got a little, uh, we, we rented this little sort of uh, b and uh, with an Irish couple. There was 50 quid a week, which you do your washing, you get bed and breakfast. And, and we were happy out. We were getting free snooker in, in Ilford Snooker Center. And I remained there. Uh, you know, right up until uh, 1998. So after our Wonderwood Championship in 97. Uh, but it was all down to Eugene Hughes getting us the table, getting us the free time and sort of putting us up and helping us settle in. And it was another few snooker lads that had come over from Ireland. So it was a great sort of uh, 
there was a great little sort of Irish community in that part of uh, Essex and Ilford. And uh, we had the Shannon Centre beside us. We, you know, lots of Irish would congregate at weekends. So it was, it was sort of a, it was a nice community and it was a great way, great place to practice. And that was the first time I'd sort of met Ronnie O'Sullivan. He was only 12 years of age. And I used to practice with him uh, even then, all that, all those years back. <laughs> well, uh, listen, there's, there's so many things. You've suddenly jumped from going over to London and then you stayed there to 98. And you'd already become the world snooker champion by that stage as well as meeting Ronnie. So, so many things I need to pick up on from, from those great stories. So what was the kind of turning point whenever you're suddenly you're practicing every day, you're just around the corner from where you need to go to the snooker hall? What was it that, that made you think, I either need to do more or was there someone that was leading the way that you wanted to follow and copy? Uh, well, I mean, there was um, Eugene Hughes, who was the resident professional, as I said. he I used to sort of practice with him. He was on the tour. He'd been on a successful sort of winning side with Alex Higgins and, and Dennis Taylor winning the World Cup for Ireland. And he had great experience and great knowledge, and he passed that on and even practiced with him watching the way you sort of make breaks and stuff like that. and uh, But when you went into that environment, com it was completely different to the way I was uh, back in Randlett and Jason's, uh, even though I sort of, you know, did four or five hours. But over there, you know, you had five or six different players, top quality players, top quality amateur players, as well as Eugene, the professional, that you could play off every single day, almost like sparring partners. So I'd go in, I'd do my like hours, maybe two hours solo practice, and then I take on these guys every day, you know, and play them all day long. Like, you know, we would spend like 10 hours in the snooker club there. And um, it was just great. Uh, I was learning so much. I was getting so much sharper. I was building confidence because when I come over from Ireland, I, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I, I knew I was half decent in Ireland, but against all these players in England uh, and also at weekends, we had sort of pro-ams around the country where I used to hitch lifts or jump on buses or get trains to. Uh, and um, playing in the competitions really sort of improved my game no end, like at least by 21 points. And I started to win them. I started to win some of them and I started to build up a bit of confidence. And then, uh, and, uh, and then it sort of just snowballed from there. I started to get a little bit of belief in myself, belief that I didn't have as much before. Uh, to realize that sort of these guys, as much as I sort of put them on a pedestal, you know, I, I started to beat some of them and I started to get a bit of confidence. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, I, could, I, I think I can do this now. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure before, but I think I can do it. You know, I, I, I might be able to make some sort of a living out of this and uh, might be able to turn professional. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't even a professional at this. I was still only an amateur. And and that's where I'm really fascinated because I know that whenever I left Belfast at 16 to join Tottenham Hotspur, I definitely had an inferiority complex. You know, I was walking in with the likes of Jurgen Klinsmann and Teddy Sheringham and, you know, later Davis Jindal Lesford. And, and I just thought there's no way I could ever do that. And I'm wondering if you had my kind of mentality leaving Ireland and going across to England, or did you have a bit more self-belief and thinking, you know what? I know I am good, and then suddenly the tournament wins just cemented that belief you already had. Yeah, I think no, I I, I think I I sort of uh, I sort of I, I was looking forward to the challenge. It wasn't that I, I had sort of a complete inferior complex, you know. I had sort of belief in myself, but I, maybe I put these other guys on too much of a pedestal, and it was only when I started to beat them uh, that I sort of my confidence grew and grew, but. I always, you know, I always felt that, you know, if you work hard, you know, you put in the work, give yourself a chance, you know. Uh, there's always a great saying that when you're behind, you never give up, but when you're ahead, you never let up. But I always felt that, you know, as long as I keep trying, I was sort of, a, I had a great sort of all-round game um, that sort of would, would stand to me. I had sort of, I could able to hold myself together under pressure. And uh, even though I put these guys on pedestals, I... When I started to beat them, it sort of gave me that sort of belief, you know, that I could compete with some of the best amateurs in the world. Uh, I was winning sort of pro-ams against like, you know, fields of 128 players on weekends. And, and, and very, very quickly, I became one of the best players in, in the whole of England, uh, which was fantastic. And, and that gave me untold confidence. And uh, 
Uh, yeah, so it was a, it was a sort of it was a slow burner. It took me like a couple of years, but uh, yeah, I got I ended up turning professional then in 1990. I went to the World Amateur Championships in 1980. It's a couple of things that happened to me actually in 1988 uh, and 1989. I tried to get onto the professional circuit, uh, and I missed out just by by one match, two matches actually. Um, I got down to the, the top sort of 24 amateurs in, in the whole of the, the country. We had a series of like qualifying tournaments, uh, but I just missed out. A guy called Dave Harrell beat me. So I had to start back right from the beginning again and then try and work myself back up. I came back to Ireland to play in the Irish Amateur Championship, which would give me a ticket to go to the World Amateur Championship, which was held in Singapore that year. And that was 1989. Uh, and as much as the devastating of actually not getting on the pro circuit, that year, it actually helped me uh, because I, I was absolutely devastated. I remember coming back to Ilford, I took the queue, I threw it under the bed. I didn't want to see the queue for a couple of weeks. Uh, I had to, I, I sort of made the decision then, okay, I have to go back to Ireland, I have to win that Irish Amateur Championship. That will give me a ticket to go to the World Amateur Championship. And if I win that, I'll get a ticket onto the professional circuit the following year, which would have been 1990. So that's what I did. I went back, I won the Irish Amateur Championship in, in the, the Royal Dublin Hotel in O'Connor Street. I beat Anthony O'Connor uh, in the final. And then I went to the World Amateur Championship in Singapore in 1989. Uh, and I beat a guy called John Birch, 11-2 in the final, who was also trying to turn professional that year. And uh, once I won the World Amateur Championship, it was, it, was a, it was a huge tournament to win. And it gave me a ticket to turn professional the following year. But it actually... Looking back, losing out in that in 1988 was actually a, a sort of a blessing in disguise. And it's interesting how those down moments or learning moments, if, if you might want to call it that, how they can have such you know huge benefits for us, even though we might not realize it at the time. And also just wanted to pick up on whenever you talked about meeting a 12-year-old Ronnie O'Sullivan, could you see, even at that age, what potentially could go on to? Or was he just another good young player who was, you know, a little bit precocious. Oh, no. no, he was a precocious talent, uh, cracking young player. He got a, a wonderful attitude. He was. He used to actually come to some of the pro-ams and he'd sit in the front row and watch me play my matches. Uh, his father used to send a taxi for me to go around to his house. He had a table at the bottom of his garden in Ilford and his father used to ring me up and say, look, at, can you come around and, and have a set with Ronnie? I said, yeah, of course. And we used to, we used to go around there and uh, you know, go down the bottom of the garden and play a couple of best of nineteens. Come in for a bit of lunch, then go back out for another best of nineteen. And uh, I could tell even from then he had a wonderful talent. I was eighteen, he was only twelve, uh, uh, but still he was a, a great practice partner to play with. And as he sort of grew up, you know, he became better and better, and just knew his sort of potential. He was he was making like century breaks at twelve years of at ten years of age. You know, I didn't make my first century until I was about 13. But uh, he was uh, making them at 10. He was making one four sevens by the time he was 12. He was just an amazing, amazing talent. I always say, though, you know, when people ask me about who's the best player you've ever played, I said, well, probably Ronnie O'Sullivan. But I used to beat him 10-2, 10-3 every day. Now, he was only 12 at the time, but it still, it still counts in my book. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You're taking that all day long. <laughs> Yeah, well, listen, if you are just joining us here. Yeah, sorry, I was we just going to say. We are here. Oh. Go on, Ken. Go on, Ken. Yeah, go No, go on. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I was just going to say, when the funny thing was, like, as we sort of grew up, he, he played in Elford and we had table, like, next to each other. Um, but for the, um, for the World Championship in 1997, I'm just skipping forward a little bit, but the World Championship in 1997, we made a conscious decision to practice with each other every single day. And we sort of, before that, we were sort of playing intermittently, not playing each, even though we were playing in the same club. He'd play somebody, I'd play someone. And we, we sort of became a little bit rivals, you know, because we were playing each other in professional tournaments and sometimes I'd beat him or he'd beat me. So uh, we sort of had a, our sort of relationship sort of, it wouldn't have been, it was more of a professional relationship rather than a, a sort of a, a friendly relationship, you know. Uh, but for that two weeks before that World Championship in 97, we made a conscious decision, okay, come on, let's just have a best of nine day in every day. Just let's both of us try and get as sharp as we can. 
and see what we can do in this World Championship. And uh, it really sort of sharpened me up and sharpened him up as well. I mean, he made that 147 in five minutes and 20 seconds that year, which was a record that will uh, never ever be beaten. It was quite incredible. I mean, it used to take Peter Redden five minutes and 20 seconds just to break off, you know? So <laughs> for him to make a 147 <laughs> was quite incredible. Uh, but um, yeah, and of course, I went on to win the World Championship the same year when he made that magical 147. So that, that bit of practice together really sort of benefited both of us. Yeah, well, it, it's just fascinating hearing Ken Doherty talk about his experiences coming through in the amateur ranks of professionals. And we are live on LinkedIn, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, mm -hmm. and Instagram. And, and Ken, I, I really have. I'd love to just talk for the entire 60 minutes about the final and, and winning it in 97 against Stephen Hendry. I know you've done so much of that before, but I, I suppose from my point of view, I'm just so fascinated by this world of mindset and mental performance and psychology and you know everything around it. So just as a kind of starting point, before you went into that match, into the final, you'd obviously done really well, performing really well to get to the final. What was your mindset or belief like before you'd even stepped into the arena? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you, the, the start of that tournament, and, and this is the way things can really sort of change. The start of that tournament, I was sort of under a bit of pressure. I had a, a really sort of bad sort of a couple of tournaments before the World Championship. I lost 6-0 to Davis in the Masters in, in uh, Wembley. I lost 6-1 to him over here, Steve Davis at the Irish Masters um, and I was sort of struggling to stay in the top 16. I was an established top 16 player but if I didn't win my first match at the World Championship I could have been knocked out of the top 16 which was would have been a huge loss and uh, you know financially as well as you know having a top 16 season for the following for the following year is it was, was a big thing. So I was only sort of really thinking about my first match, uh, which was against a guy called Mark Davis uh, in the very, very first round. And um, that was really all I was concentrating on going into that year. And as sharp as I was in practice in the build-up to playing with Ronnie O'Sullivan, also I was thinking, don't think too far ahead, just try and win this match. If you win this match, you're guaranteed your top 16 place. And then you're into the tournament, it's best of 25s, and then let, let's see how it goes from there. I had a really tough match with him. I eventually beat him 10-8 in the end. And uh, it was uh, very, very tough. But it was like almost like a huge release. I was guaranteed top 16. It was sort of the pressure just sort of was lifted off my shoulders. I was playing Steve Davis in the second round. It would absolutely trash me, as I said, 6-0, 6-1. Uh, but I had a completely different mindset. I had sort of got my confidence back. I had a bit more belief in myself, and I thought, okay, Davis, you beat me. You're one of the best players, but you're going to have to scrape me off this table to beat me this time <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna really sort of put as much effort as I can in. Not that I didn't before, but just going to try and try and try, and you're going to face a different uh, Ken Doherty. I'm not going to let you sort of dominate the game and dictate the pace of the game. I'm just going to, you know, come out far and play with confidence, play quickly around the table, get you out of your comfort zone and then see what happens. And um, I got off to a wonderful start. I was 6-2 up after the first session. Uh, the first frame of the evening session, Davis came out, he won the first frame and he gave it the fist. And I'd never seen Davis give it the fist before, so early in a match, just because he won that frame. And he was still 6-3 behind. And I thought, well, if he's going to do that just to win one frame, he must be seriously under pressure, you know? And, and in a way, that sort of gave me that bit, a little bit of confidence and it sort of made me even more determined. And I said, okay. I said, said to myself, all right, up yours, Davis. I said, you're going to get it from me now. And uh, I eventually beat Davis 13-3. I beat him with a session to spare. It's never happened to Steve Davis at the World Championship in, in the Crucible in, in his whole career. So to beat him with a session to spare uh, was a huge... Um, confidence booster, a huge feather in my cap. And and then I went on, uh, you know, it just, it just felt like so tall, like going into that arena. I felt like, you know, I was really sort of so comfortable. I played John Higgins in the next round. I beat him 
Uh, and then before I got to the final, I played Elaine Robbie do in the semi final from Canada, another top 16 player. I beat him with a session to spare, 17 7. So going in, I'm playing Stephen Hendry in the final now. And Stephen Hendry hasn't lost a match at the Crucible for the previous five years. He's gone for six in a row. But the one thing that I had in, in my sort of uh, in my own mindset was that I could see myself lifting the cup. You know, they talk about visualization. I could I was dream I dreamt about lifting that cup from when I got that for a snooker table when I was eight. And when I was in the final for that couple of weeks, I was I saw myself lifting the cup and giving it a big kiss, just like Higgins did in eighty two when he was crying with the baby, just like Dennis Taylor did in eighty five. I could actually see myself lift the cup and lift it up to the ceiling lights and give it a big kiss. And whether it was a dream or visualization, whatever it would have been, those images sort of kept me really calm. And even though I was playing the greatest player that's ever played the game, that's ever been at the Crucible, uh, Stephen Hendry, uh, as I said, he was going for six, six tournaments in a row. I had that belief, that sort of a calmness about it. I played, went out there, played with a smile on my face, even though I was a little bit nervous, of course I was, but I was loving every single minute of it. And I think the fact that the calmness, the sort of visualization, the belief, the dream, everything uh, sort of gave me that sort of extra sort of calmness to, to go and, and play my game, not worry about who I was playing, not worry about Stephen Hendry, keep him in the seat as long as possible. Uh, and that, without a shadow of a doubt, helped me win that World Championship because otherwise I would have been as nervous as a kitten and he probably would have, like, you know, stamped all over me and shown a sort of, you know, a, a sort of a torrent of class, you know, uh, that he had. But uh, I didn't let him do that. I didn't let him bully me. In fact, I was bullying him uh, with the way I was playing. And, and uh, that's how I won the World Championship in '97. Yeah, amazing. Just absolutely amazing to hear that and, and you know, win it by 18-12. Such a great margin of victory as well. So I've, I've got a little bit of a kind of a question exercise. I'm not sure how, how to pose this, but essentially, because you won, because you're now, you know, world snooker champion, whenever I think about the performance of football and, and me trying to improve and how I sort of put it down to, you know, I would say you could probably divide performance into the technical aspect of what you do the physical aspect, the psychological aspect, and then also the social. So with those four kind of areas of performance in mind, just thinking about you in the final, what mm. percentage of all those four areas, can you think was most important for you winning the World Snooker Championship in 1997? I think definitely the psychology. Oh. Uh, yeah, without I mean, a shadow even in terms of a number, even in terms of numbers, what, what, what kind of numbers would you say you know, 25, obviously, 25, obviously 25 or what? Your technique has to be pretty sound. Uh, you know, of course, you have to you have to have a really good technique, particularly in snooker. You know, because of the, you know the stillness on the shot and keeping the cue straight and, and not moving. You know, and technically, you know, with your grip and your bridge, everything has to be pretty sound. Uh, so it's technically, you know, say like, I don't know, maybe twenty percent. I'd say. I'd say twenty percent to the to the other parts of the game, but certainly maybe sixty percent to the psychology because it's amazing. You talked at the top of the interview about the, the little sort of the six inches between the ears, you know, in, in sport and in life generally, but I think particularly in sport about your mindset, about your, your sort of psychology, about your confidence, about the sort of not worrying about whether you missed this shot, is he gonna, you know, win the frame from? So all that sort of comes into question. And sometimes you'd be sitting in your chair and you'd be questioning yourself. Uh, and that's the, the sort of, they're the worst times when you're sat down because you, your mind is sort of, you, you sort of think a lot more and you start to worry, you know, what, what's gonna happen here? What's gonna do this? And, and particularly against David Hendry that, in that final, you know, I went 15, seven up. And the first to 18, he came back to 15, 12. He won five frames in a row. And that was when I was at my most nervous. That was when I doubted myself uh, because I thought I'd seen Stephen Hendry come back against different players throughout his career. And I was sitting in my chair and I'm thinking, please don't do this comeback. Not to me, not now, not in this position that I'm in. I will never get over this. 
you know so i was dealing with that in my mind um and i'm trying to you're trying to put positive thoughts in your mind you just say no just play your game you get one chance you're going to win the frame and you so you're questioning yourself you're talking to yourself but if you keep yourself in a positive mind about how you're playing and how you got here and the matches that you won and how well you you, you played it, even in this final alone uh, that's so so important in sport and particularly in individual sports and snooker it comes into effect more often than not and uh, i think yeah my psychology my mindset my confidence was pretty good uh, and that and of course as i said the belief and the visualization really really helped you know and, and and that's where you know this this is why i kind of i love this subject Ken, because when you're talking about you're sitting there with just one frame to go to lift in the yeah. world snooker championship and you're still thinking that you know is it is it the little voice in your head that's kind of going to be the difference is it you almost trying to bring yourself back to a way of thinking oh i need to think a bit more you know constructively or a little bit more helpfully and yet probably snooker is one of those sports that whenever you're playing it it's a, probably quite unique that if someone else is on the table you physically can't do anything and there's nothing you can do to stop whereas if i'm playing football you know i can stop them i can stop them from tackling you know pretty much mm. snooker is the only one where you have to kind of sit there and you have no way yeah. of doing anything until you're back at the table that must be really difficult to <laughs> deal with i think that's the, that's the hardest part about the game is that you can do absolutely nothing as you said in, in, in football or you know, team sports, you can tackle or, you know, take the ball from the other, other uh, opponents. Uh, in snooker, you just have to sit there and wait. You know, in golf, you have your own ball. You just worry about your own shot, your own technique, you know, and uh, whatever hole you might be playing. But in golf or in snooker, yeah, you've just got to sit and wait. And sometimes, you know, you might not make a mistake. You might, like, just play a break off. He puts a long ball and he goes on to make a century and you're sitting there for the whole frame. He might get a fluke, you know, he might play a safety shot, it might go wrong, he flukes a red and he's banging amongst the balls and he goes on to make another century, you know. So there's sometimes you, you can't do anything. That's the hardest part I think about snooker. One of the one of the toughest part, if not the hardest part about the game. And and that's where your your mindset and your psychology has to be right, to, you know, to to keep yourself sort of on the edge that knowing that when you do get your chance you have to be ready so you have to keep sort of saying to yourself keep giving yourself sort of positive thoughts all the time uh, to, to 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 make sure that when your concentration when you're at the table that your concentration is full on that you haven't sort of wavered that you haven't let your mind go and that you're still in a really good place to sort of finish a frame that if you do get the chance so yeah it is it is quite difficult um and for those frames when stephen Hentry was coming back you know you're praying that he gets a kick or he miscues or you know anything just to get you back at the table and he missed one red where he should have gone uh he should have actually gone uh 15 30 we would have had a break gone to the gone to the dressing room had a little interval uh and I made a 60 break and, he, and I played a stupid shot and he got back in and he was going to make a 60 odd break and win the frame. And he missed one red down behind the black, down along the cushion and it stayed in the jaws of the pocket. Uh, two reds left on 30 something be in, in front. I only need a red and a colour. Well, I leapt out of the chair like a great hand. I couldn't get to the table. Uh, the pot the red, the pot the black, pot the other red. And I'm 16, 12. I sort of broke the momentum of Stephen Hendry. We go into the dressing room uh, and I'm 16, 12. Now I'm two, two from the front instead of being two ahead, you know, 15, 30. It was a huge frame and uh, that was his chance gone uh, and then sort of relaxed me again. I came out and I won the last two frames. Uh, but yeah, the, the, you know, once I, once I got that sort of, uh, got that frame, it was a, a big relief and then I, I sort of got my confidence got my momentum again and that's what happens in snooker you know one one missed shot can change the whole perspective on a match uh, and that's exactly what happened and that helped me uh, win the world championship well if you're joining us for the last 15 minutes of the show we're going live on linkedin on facebook youtube twitter and instagram and i'm delighted to say that i'm joined by world snooker champion ken doherty I can interest more we just talked about how snooker when you're not at the table it's almost you can't do anything to control the situation and, and I don't know why I've, I just thought of this analogy or, or almost 
how this can apply to life because how does that ability to deal with that in snooker help you because i'm guessing in life the same things happen that you could be going about your business and suddenly something completely out of your control come and you know takes you out from the side and that must be really difficult to deal with but hopefully the skills you've built up in snooker could potentially help you with that would that be right yeah i mean you know like in in sports you, you sort of get knocks all the time you know and, and like you know i always say Jenny, I wish I could have, you know, like in 97 when I was in that uh, final or uh, just for those couple of weeks uh, that I wish I could have bottled it, you know, and, and like just drank it for every like sort of world championship thereafter. Uh, but it, it doesn't work out like that, you know. Uh, sometimes, yeah, it, like things can happen and you get a lot of knocks in the game. You know, listen, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, as you said, like you, you spend a whole career trying to be world champion, you know, and you but you remember just for that. That, that world championship but it was you know there's been a lot of knocks on the way uh, there's been a lot of knocks afterwards you know but that's the journey of, of being a, a sports person that's the journey of life really you know you take your knocks in life uh, but you sort of get you pick yourself up you dust yourself down you put it down to experience and then you try and uh, you know make it better next time or you try and learn from it and, and, and try and keep going you know that's I think that's the important thing is that you keep going Whatever knocks, whatever life does throw at you, that you know, you just got to dust yourself down and just try and keep going as best you can. And if you're involved in a sport, you just got to keep trying. Uh, and you know, the knocks will come all the time, but you put them down to experience, and that's the part of the journey, you know. And they always say, like, the journey is better than the end, you know. And sometimes it is, you know, because you know, I've had a wonderful life, a career, meet so many people you know, through the different stages of my professional career. And now I'm in the twilight sort of sort of time of my career, but I'm still enjoying it. I look back with a lot of fondness of, of even of the bad times, of even when I was renting the bed and breakfast, of even when I was getting on that, you know, that shoe, 36 stops. You know, I look back on that and sort of smile to myself. And I look back on it with fondness as, as difficult as it was. You know, I had 500 pounds in my pocket. I was moving to London. That's all I had in the world, you know? Um, and but I look back on a lot of the stuff with fondness, you know, because they, they not only build you up as a in my sport as a snooker player, but also in life as well. You know, it sort of it gets you ready for for what's ahead of you in life. You know, and you and you try and I I try and pass those things on a little bit by little, even though my son doesn't listen to me too much. <laughs> uh, but I try and pass those little things on. But it's always, uh, but yeah. It's, it's the knocks that you have to get on with and you just have to accept them sometimes. Uh, but you have to learn from them. I think that's the most important thing. And I think that that's a, a, such a great message to share from someone who's you know pretty much been at the summit. You know, you've been at the top of the mountain. You've been the best in the world. That's probably quite difficult for someone who hasn't been at the summit, is still at the bottom, but is looking up there thinking, I'd really love to get there, but I keep getting these disappointments. I'm just wondering how you might share anything, Ken, that, that might be able to help someone who, whether they're well, an aspiring snooker player, sportsman, or or yeah. anyone just have with any aspirations in life. I've just, I've, listen, I've been to the top of the mountain, but I've certainly been to the bottom of the mountain a lot of times as well. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, also, also I would say is, look, you have to, enjoy what you do you know you have to as i said you're going to get knocks it's going to be very very difficult but you have to keep believing in yourself and keep doing your best you know and try and you tick all the boxes you know you cover every angle that you can and, and try and give it a hundred percent you know and that's all you can do in life you try and give give everything a hundred percent if you're going to do something give it a hundred percent and and even if it doesn't work out well, at least you've said to yourself, your conscience is clear. I've done my best. I've tried to do cover every angle. I've tried to improve myself as best as I can. And if it's not to be, it's not to be. But at least you can go on in life and say, I did my best at that as, to try to be a professional sportsman or whatever I tried to do. But if I didn't get to the top, I didn't become, not everybody can become world champion, you know, and I feel very blessed that I am. Uh, not everybody can can get to the top, but but what you can do, you can have a great journey, just trying to trying to get to the top. You know, you can have great experiences, you'll have great life experiences, and they will sort of 
they will stand to you in different parts of life that you will take as you go along. You know, when you, when you take up something else and, you, and your sport doesn't work out for you. But, you know, I think that's that's the key thing is that to enjoy the the bad times as well as the good times, you know, and there will be bad times along the way, but you have to just give it your best. And if it doesn't work out, you can sleep at night and your conscience is clear, but enjoy the journey at the same time. Yeah, I think that's really is the skill and, and the difficulty that, you know, must be harder to enjoy the tough times, the bad times. And, and, and you mentioned there, Ken, about how you're now, you called it in the twilight of your career. How have you dealt with that almost uh, transition? from yeah. you know, playing, winning, titles, all the rest of it, to suddenly not performing at the same level, not having the same yeah. expectations, and almost just not being able to do what you could do, knowing that you're yeah. now doing something else with your life. It is. It's very, it is very frustrating now as, as you get a bit older because you think, you know, your mind is still as active as, and as, as enthusiastic as, as it ever was, you know? And I still love the game, and I know I can't perform like I, I did, like when I was when I was twenty seven, you know. Uh, so it, it's it's a hard one to sort of to to get your head around it to sort of ex, you know accept that, uh, but you just have to, you know. I, I just sort of I've come to the realization: look, I'm not I'm not the player I was like twenty years ago. So in the few years that I have left playing, just enjoy it. Try and do the best you can. I watched Phil Mickelson last night, fifty-one, winning the PGA Championship, which was fantastic. I mean, that was you know very inspirational what he has done. And you know, I try and still give it a hundred percent. Try and still do as best as I can. And um, but now the knocks are, even though they're knocks, I don't take them so so hard on myself. Before, like when I'd lose and go into the apartment and like the, the queue would go under the bed, you know, and I'd, I'd sit in and I'd open, watch TV for a couple of days until like I got the courage to come back out and go back up to the snooker, to, back up to the snooker club and expect all the stick I was going to get from all the boys up there. Uh, but now I just, you know, I forget about it. I sort of, you know, if I lose, I lose. I don't take it to heart as much. I just get on with it and look forward to the next one. You know, I, as I said, I've had a, I've had a wonderful career. I still love, I still love playing, and I still love being around the snooker circuit. I'm still involved with the with the World Snooker Association, and I, of course, I do the TV work, which I really enjoy. Uh, and that sort of, you know, that sort of, that, that's part of my life now, you know. And, and playing is not as a priority as it once was. So playing now is just sort of, uh, I'm just playing for more of enjoyment and. You know, trying to win a match here and there and trying to do as best as I can, but it's not sort of the be and end all as it once was. And is there an element of legacy to do with being involved with the World Snooker Association? Because I believe you're chair, is that right? From what I what I read? I'm chairman of the of the players board. Yeah, no, I just uh, I love the game, you know, I want to see it progress, I want to see it, you know, pr- improve it in in lots of different aspects uh, and fulfill its, its, its sort of potential uh, and i want the best for the players as well you know i want you know the best conditions the, the best uh, tournaments and the best you know the best for the players and the players rights and i think that's very very important that we need a body to stand up for the players i think that that's just very very important for you know to to uh, to be able to work with world snooker limited and 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 create a really as best model as we can, you know, going forward. So yeah, that's part and parcel. Of it. But the other work as well, you know, the BBC work I love doing. I love being around the likes of Virgo and Taylor and, and Davis and Hendry and Barrett. We have such good laugh, you know, we have such good fun. Alan McManus as well. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's more like they're my snooker family, I call them, you know, so we get on great. We have nice meals, we have great banter and and we, we go out and play a little bit of golf together and just just really good sort of social times and i think uh yeah they're they're, they're much snooker family yeah and again seeing you seeing you on the tv doing it you look like you're having a blast with with all the guys all the time and and i suppose i've got a couple of questions for you ken now and i can't believe this 60 minutes has, has flown by so the two questions that i kind of generally want to end on because it, it you know you talked about absolutely the the best times in your career some tough times along the way. Has there been a price to having the success that you've had in your career? 
has there been a price? Uh, I suppose, I think, you know, the price would have been being away from your family uh, quite a bit, being on the road quite a bit. You know, we have a young son now, he's, he's 13. So, you know, being away from him a little bit as he was sort of growing up. Uh, and also my other, you know, my, my siblings, my two brothers, my sister, my mom. My mom passed away uh, in two thousand and seventeen. But you know, sh you know, those would have been the times. You know, not not spending as much time with them over the years and not seeing them as much as I would have liked. Uh, they would have been sort of the tough times, you know. But I suppose the, the, the good times outweighed them. You know, when I came back, I got off that, uh, got off the plane into Dublin. Uh, with the World Championship trophy, and my mother was waiting at the bottom of the steps of the plane, and uh, I handed it to her, you know, and I said, "This is for you, ma'am." You know, and she put it, she took it back to Renla, back to our house in Renla, and she she stuck it on top of the TV, and she used to clean it every day. And to see her face after all the, you know, the years of traveling here and there with your queue, or going into Jason's and Renla, or going into town with the queue on the on the bus, or all those times being away. And uh, she'd be worrying about me, you know, that it was sort of, it would have been worth it in the end, you know, and I'm sure my father was, was looking down on me as well with a little sort of smile on his face too. So, so those times sort of make up for, 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 for all this sort of the times that, you know, the, the down times basically, you know. Yeah, and I actually just got goosebumps just as you, you're sharing that story with, uh, with passing the World Snooker Championship trophy to your mum and, and, and her taking that back to the house. Uh, she must have been so proud. And, and uh, yeah. I suppose now, the funny, I was she, talking about... Had the, oh, sorry, she, go on. She, had the, she had the door open of the house, you know, Paul, and she'd say, and people would be coming and be knocking at the door, can we, can we have a look at the cup, you know? And she'd say, yeah, come on in. There it is, it's on top of the TV, you know, so... Even all the sort of strangers would come in just to get a glimpse of the cup, and you could see it from the from the avenue, you know, on top of the TV as you pass by the window. Yeah, but she was so proud; she'd clean it every day, and she used to always tell me to give up snooker, you know, to, to sort of get a real job, you know, because it was so. She sort of she'd sort of be up and down with her emotion, her own emotions, you know, when I'd be playing, and uh, so uh, she had to go through an awful lot as a mother, but. Uh, yeah, she was. Uh, but she it was worth it, you know. In the end, you know, she once. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, she used to make cakes. She was a great baker, you know. And she used to make apple tarts for the local uh, spa shop, you know, in Renly. Yeah. And uh, she'd do mm -hmm. it every weekend. And and in 1997, um, I was up in bed, you know. It was early morning, eight o'clock in the morning, you know. I'd come in from a night out, like in, uh, you know, I'd been home for a weekend, so I'd come in from a night out. Uh, I was up in bed, and she was baking the apple tarts. And she rang the shop for the manager to come up and bake the, uh, to come up and collect the apple tarts. You know, so the manager says, "Oh, we're too busy, Miss Starry. I can't come up. You'll have to wait maybe an hour or so." So you know, so she said, "Don't worry." He said, "I'll send my son down." You know, so she shouted up to me, "Get it, get up out of that bed!" So she gets me to bring down a breadboard full of apple tarts in the middle of Renlet. I'm 1997 world champion, and here I'm. At. I'm not the world champion in her eyes. I'm only still her son, Kenneth, that she used to call me, you know. Get up out of that bed, Kenneth, and I'm walking down the middle of Renla with a red board full of apple tarts that she's selling for £2 a guy to the local parish. <laughs> so I was brought fairly back down to back down to earth. If ever I was going to get a big head, you couldn't get a big head in our house, that's for sure, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that feeling very much. Keep your feet on the ground. Absolutely no possibility of doing that whenever you're from this part of the world. Um, so last question for you then, Ken. Uh, as you said, you're in twilight of your your playing career, but you've you know had a very successful career as as a pundit and commentator um, on the snooker on TV night. But you know, he's talking about your son, all the other things you've got going on, chair of the World Snooker Association. What would you say is the definition for you at this point in your life going forward? Uh, what's the definition of for me? Uh, of, success. of success, sorry. Uh, yeah. Of going forward. Uh, I don't know. I think, I think my success, you know, you, you, it's sort of, it's not, it's not the world championship. You know, I think it's just, look, I've had a great life, you know, I've had a wonderful life. I think that is success in itself. I've enjoyed, you know, so many different parts of the game. I've 
of the competition, you know, the adrenaline, like the highs and lows of playing a sport, the places that I've visited, the, the people that I've met, the, you know, the friendships that I've, I've, I've made, you know, and I still have like friends from when I started out as, you know, as a, you know, 10 year old going into Jason's, I still have friends from those days. Uh, and they're still some of my best friends now. And I think that, that for me is, you know, is success, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, the accolades that you collect along the way, then they're, they're not as meaningful, I think, as, you know, the journey of life and the friends that you meet along the way and the friendships and the bonds that you've made. And for me, I think that's more of a success uh, than anything else, like, you know, and, and the rest is just, it's just sort of, you know, they're just things, you know, they're just like cups or whatever. But I think, you know, the, the journey of life and the success of friendships and, and as you go through life, I think that's for me more, much more important. Ken Doherty, thanks very much for joining us. I really, really enjoyed that. My pleasure, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, hopefully you can join us next Monday where I'm going to be speaking to Red Arrows pilot Dan Lowe's. So we'll be doing that at Monday at 10 a.m. So if you're around for that, come and join us for another episode of The Psychology of Success. And thanks very much for listening.